Hi, and welcome to the top five C++ questions. My name is Adrian Levin, and I'm a content developer here at Microsoft Learning. I've tirelessly scouted out the top five C++ questions within the intermediate C++ level that corresponds with our intermediate C++ course available on edX. Let's take a look at the first question. The first question asks, can we access a piece of memory outside the scope of its current stack frame. So if you're familiar with the stack in C++, you'll know that each level of function has its own stack frame. So for example, int main has its own piece of memory where the local variables and everything we're operating on within main is stored. However, once we move to another function, for in this case, pointer gen, we no longer can access the local variables stored within main. They're called local for a reason. So let's test out what happens if we create an int i here, which is now being stored within the pointer gen stack frame, and then return its address, and then try to access that same local variable in a different stack frame once we get back to main. So you can see here that we get the address of this integer from uh, a different stack frame. We'll print it out, see what's exactly hiding in the memory at that address, then try to change it, and then print it out again. So if all goes well and nothing gets screwed up, this should just print out 1, 2. Let's run it and see what happens. So you can see that here in our console it did print out 1, 2, which means that we actually could access the, the value of i even despite the fact that we are no longer within the pointer gen stack frame. However, I will warn you that this is not a guarantee. You can think of this i as a public piece of property. While we're in the, the pointer gen function, we have control over this piece of property. We can put in whatever we want, we can change the value, and we can use it to influence other pieces of property. However, once we leave the pointer gen function, we no longer have control over that. It's possible that that piece of memory will be reused by the compiler uh, for a different part of the stack frame. Maybe it stores another local variable for a different function, or maybe it stores something completely different. We don't know. That's the point. So I encourage you to only access local variables while you're in their, that respective stack frame, and never otherwise, because you have no guarantees about what's going to happen to that piece of memory if you're outside of its respective stack frame. Question two, what exactly does the delete keyword actually do? Let's take a look at some code. So you can see here that I just have a very simple function that creates an integer. Um, mind you that this is creates a pointer to an integer that's being stored elsewhere on the heap which is a different piece of memory than the stack where most local variables are stored. Then we set the value at this address to 100. Then we delete that pointer. So we'll see what happens when we try to dereference that pointer and find out what exactly is at that memory address after we've deleted it. Let's run the code and see what happens. So you can see here that it throws a read access violation. Essentially, this is the compiler telling me that I really should not be doing this because it can lead to some really bad errors. So what is really causing this ultimately? Well, it's all based on what exactly the delete key does. When we allocate memory on the heap, like we do in this new int line, that memory is uh, marked off by the compiler to say that we can access this and this piece of memory is tied to our pointer i. However, once we delete it, the compiler is essentially saying we are no longer going to access this piece of memory. It can be used for whatever we want. Maybe it'll be written over by a different function, or maybe it won't be used at all. But we have no guarantees about what's going to happen to it. So if we try to access it, it could be bad, because we could access memory that's, being, that's trying to store something else which could lead to many different security problems as well as just your code not working. In this case, if we looked at the piece of memory where i is, we would see that actually it, it is still equal to 100 um, because nothing has been updated 
since we deleted the association between the pointer and that piece of memory. However, since we have no guarantees about what that piece of memory now points to, uh, we're not allowed to access it. So you can think of the delete key as uh, a way of the compiler to say that this memory is now off limits in the context of the pointer that we created earlier. The delete key doesn't actually delete the memory, the memory is still there, but uh, we can no longer access it in the same way that we could before we deleted that association. Question three. Is the size of a struct equal to the sum of the sizes of the variables that are stored within it? Let's find out, shall we? So you can see here that I've created two structs, struct one and struct two, that store a couple of very small variables. Struct one has a one byte character, a two byte short, and a four byte integer. So if we just add these all up, in total we should have a struct of size seven bytes. Next, we have struct two, which contains two one byte characters, a four byte integer, and a two byte short. In total, that should be eight bytes. Now, let's run our main function and see what the size of these, the actual size of these two structs are. So you can see here that we've printed out the sizes of our structs, and it's not exactly what we expected. Struct 1 is size 8, and struct 2 is size 12. What exactly is going on here? The answer is padding. The way that compilers work, and especially with C++, is that it's much more efficient to store things within blocks of 4 bytes based on the way that memory addresses work. So, when we have our one byte character and our two byte short, we're not gonna put our four byte integer right at the end of that, because we wanna put everything into its own neat little four byte bucket, and that we don't want anything overlapping. So what's actually happen happening here is that we have our one byte character and our two byte short, and then we have an additional one byte of padding, which makes the struct a little bit nicer to fit within this four byte bucket structure. Struct two is also a little bit surprising because if you think about it, surely we should be able to fit these numbers within four bytes. We can just put our two one byte characters next to each other and then fill in the additional two bytes of that four byte bucket with our short, and then have our integer c be the additional four bytes. So in total, it should just be two four-byte buckets for a total of eight. However, we saw that the actual size of struct two is 12 bytes. And the reasoning for that is that it's much more efficient for the compiler to, instead of moving our short d up here to where it would fit in our uh, the, the two bytes of room that we have left, it just inserts another two bytes of padding here. And instead of uh, moving around the short D, it inserts another two bytes of padding. Giving us a total of 12 bytes. You can see that structs will always end up with a a size that is a multiple of four bytes, just because it's a lot easier for the compiler to do the math that way. That should clear up the discrepancy between what we think should actually be the size of our structs and what the actual observable size is of these structs. It all has to do with how the compiler works and the efficiency and the optimization that the compiler uses in order to make your program faster. This isn't super important in the current year because we don't really have to worry about memory sizes given that we're working with such powerful computers. But back in the early days of programming, these considerations were a lot more important. So it's an interesting piece of history to consider the size of structs and their actual observable size. Question four, what is meant by the if and def and define keywords? If you've interacted with someone else's code before, 
Chances are you've probably seen the if and if and define keywords. But well, what exactly do they do? The answer is, these are called include guards. Essentially, they prevent the compiler from including the same tokens or files multiple times. Think about a scenario where we want to include file one. File one's code gets added to ours, including any pound include statements as well. If file one pound includes file two, which in, turns, which in turn includes file one, we'll end up with a recursive loop and our code will become infinitely long. Obviously, this is bad, we want to avoid this. Also, if multiple files feature the same enumerations or static variables, it will be stuck because one token will refer, will refer to multiple things. That's where if and def comes in. Essentially, if and def is a check to see if we've already included a token. If we have, we skip that step, otherwise we continue as normal and include it. Hopefully that makes things a little bit more clear when it comes to the logic behind what happens when we include statements. Question five, what's the difference between the null keyword and the null pointer keyword? If you've worked with C++ and especially with pointers, then you know what the null keyword means. It's essentially, it means that we're pointing to something that doesn't exist. It's a, a stop, if you will. Uh, so what exactly is null pointer? Why do we need another keyword when we already have a perfectly good null? Well, let's take a look at the code and find out. So you can see here that I've defined two different functions. They're both called foo, but they take in two different types of arguments. This is the most important part of this example. A lot of times you'll overload functions and the compiler will just have to figure out which one you mean based on the, the, the typing uh, of the arguments that you pass into that function. So in our main, we call foo three times. Once with our null pointer keyword, which was recently added to the C++. Once with the, no, the number zero, and once with null. Let's run it and see what happens. So as you can see, passing in null pointer led to the second function, whereas passing in zero and null led to the first function being called. This is because null pointer has its own special type, null pointer t, which the compiler knows to treat as a pointer, rather than just a value zero. Null is essentially equal to the integer zero, and this is defined by several C++ libraries um, that are built into the language. So we would use null pointer if we needed to pass in a, null, a pointer with the value of null, but we still want it to be strongly typed as a pointer so that the compiler can interpret it correctly. A problem with null is that the compiler might get confused and treat it either as a pointer or just as the number zero. I would highly recommend using the null pointer keyword instead of null in any opportunity that you can, especially when you're dealing with pointers, just because it makes your code a little bit easier to understand for both people reading it and also for the compiler.